motto together. If it's in the Bible, I believe it. If it's not, I don't need it. Amen to that. And praise the Lord. It is good to see. Uh, I'm going to call it the house of the Lord because when we get together, isn't it just amazing? We know the Lord is in our midst. Jesus has promised to come where two or three are gathered. He sends his Holy Spirit. But we're going to ask politely that God would fill us each with his Holy Spirit. Would you bow your heads with me tonight as we pray? My Father in heaven, oh, we love you so very much. We appreciate so very much the sacrifice of Jesus. I appreciate the health that you've given each of us to come out here tonight. There's some who are still struggling with their health, Lord. Please minister to their needs. Draw close to them, reminding them of your love that you have for them. Fill us with your Holy Spirit tonight, Lord, as we are in desperate need. Spiritual things are spiritually discerned. Tonight, Father, as I present from your holy book, a message that is more about the fruit of the Spirit, God, I would ask that you would give me your Spirit to present it in a powerful way, but yet a kind way. We love you so much, Lord. We just want to do the things that please you. For I ask and I plead it in the name of Jesus. Amen. The Bible set talks about the 144,000. My message tonight is about the 144,000 revealed in the book of Revelation. Don't you want to know who this 144,000 is? Wouldn't you be excited to find out if the 144,000 was a group of people that you could actually join and become part of? Now, you've probably had somebody knock on your door at some point and make the point that says only the 144,000 are going to heaven. No more, no less, just 144,000. Well, if they've knocked on your door and told you that, you can, after tonight's message, you'll have a good answer to give to them. I would like to usually smile and say, are you part of the 144,000? You know what they respond to me? No, I'm not a part of the 144,000. It's pretty sad that people think they're not going to heaven. Friends, we can have assurance tonight that God has a place prepared for us in heaven. Amen? Jesus said, I'm going to go prepare a place for you. I'm going to come back and receive you to myself that where I am, there you may be also. We can take that, my friends, to the bank. Before I really get into the topic or the details of the 144,000 tonight, I'm going to ask a more broad and general question that I hope you can respond to affirmatively. How many of you believe in the power of God? Amen. I see hands going up. I hear amens. Praise God you believe in the power of God. Now, I know you believe in the power of God because when we talk about God creating the world in six literal 24-hour days, we know God can do that. When we talk about the global flood that came on the world, God can make a global flood come on this whole world. When we talk about Naaman going down as a leprous man coming up, his leprosy is cleansed. Like he's got baby skin. Can God do that? Can God raise the dead back to life again? There's so many stories in the Bible of resurrections. Do you believe that God could take a blind man who's been blind from birth and cause him to see? You believe in that kind of power of God? I believe in that kind of power of God. Praise the Lord. I believe in the power of God that can, that, that, that can do miracles and wonders and signs. I believe you have that kind of belief, faith as well in the creator of heaven and earth. But here's the rub. Most Christians teach this kind of power, that they believe in this kind of power, but then they deny that God gives us power to say no to temptation. Isn't that a pretty radical thought? God can raise the dead to life, but not help me say no to lying and lust and anger. And... Can God give us victory over sin? Can God make us overcomers? Yeah, I believe he can. And I tell you, as, as, I, as I think about the 144,000, it's, it's not a guess who game about, oh, what number are you? You 899 and you're number 35,264. No, that's not what the 144,000 in the Bible is about at all. The 144,000 is mentioned in the Bible because it's describing a people who are described as overcomers. Now, when you open the book of Revelation, we're gonna, I'm going to do that just real quick here. Revelation chapter 2 it describes seven churches in chapters 2 and 3. And every one of these churches has a, a feature that God highlights. Revelation chapter 2, I'm going to look in verse 7. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. So Jesus went back to heaven, right? He's preparing this new Jerusalem. And that new Jerusalem, that beautiful city up there, has the tree of life in there. And God wants you to eat from the fruit of the tree of life, doesn't he? But who gets to eat from the fruit of the tree of life? According to this Bible verse, the overcomers get to eat from the fruit of the tree of life. 
which maybe reminds you of Revelation chapter 22 and verse, what is it, 17, says in that passage, no, it's, chapter, it's verse 14, so Revelation 22, 14, uh, blessed are those who do his commandments that they may eat from the free fruit of the tree of life, right? And go in through the gates into the city. So, keeping the commandments, overcoming, you see the connection there? All right, let's keep on moving. Revelation chapter 2, looking in verse 11. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. We learned the other night that the second death is what? The lake of fire. It's talking about hell. And it says that we will not be hurt of that if you are an overcomer. All right, Revelation chapter 2 and looking, um, let's see, I'm going to, uh, verse 17. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat of the hidden manna. And I will give him a white stone, and on the stone a new name written, which no one knows except he who receives it. Revelation chapter 2 and verse 20, uh, let's see, where am I at here? Verse 26, he who overcomes and keeps my works unto the end, to him I will give power over the nations. Chapter 3 and verse uh, 5, he who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, and I will not blot out his name from the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his holy angels. Now, that is a beautiful promise. Your book gets to stay in the book of life if you are an overcomer. In fact, Jesus himself will confess, his, confess your name before the Father and his angels. Chapter 3 and verse uh, 12. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he should go out no more. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God, and I will write on him my new name. Oh, you get the new name of Jesus, and I don't even know what that's going to be. But we're going to talk about, well, those, there's a lot of details that we're not going to get into tonight. But we're going to talk about what it means to be an overcomer in just a moment. Revelation chapter 3, and look at the last one here, verse 21. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. Are you with me? Jesus says, you're going to sit with me on my throne if you're an overcomer. Now, but how do we become overcomers? Revelation chapter 12, I think it's verse 12, tells us, and they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to the death. I'll make sure that's verse 12. That's actually verse 11. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 11. They overcame him by the blood of the lamb. Oh, praise God, there's power in the blood. You love singing that song? There's power in the blood. And so the book of 1 John chapter 5 I'll get onto my lesson here in just a moment, but I'm just laying a good foundation here of being an overcomer. Revelation, or sorry, 1 John, rather, chapter 5. Look at verse 3 and 4. It says, For this is the love of God that we keep His commandments. But His commandments are not burdensome. King James says it's not grievous. His commandments are not burdensome. If you're finding that God's commandments are burdensome, you need to have a talk with Jesus. Because when you fall in love with Jesus, all of a sudden his commands become a delight. Look at verse 4. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. What's the first step to overcoming the world? Being born of God. Being born again. You want to be an overcomer? You must be born again. That's what it means by the blood of the Lamb gives us the victory in this world. And then look what the rest of it says. It says, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. We need to have the faith of Jesus if we're going to be overcomers in these last days. So when I'm talking about the 144,000 friends, I'm talking about a group of people that are overcomers. I'm talking about a group of people that say no to temptation, no to sin, and yes to Jesus. A group of people that are willing to die before they transgress God's law. Are you there yet? Am I there yet? That's a question we all have to ask ourselves because I know, I know if, you're, if you feel like me a lot, you're like, oh, I'm such a mess. How am I going to ever get there? How am I ever going to completely get the victory? But you know what? I serve a big God. I serve a God that says, with man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. I serve a God who gives me the promise that through Christ all things are possible, right? You believe in that kind of God? If He can create the world, He can recreate your heart. And He can help you overcome the desires of the flesh. He can help you to overcome and be victorious in this world. The Bible says in Romans 1.16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. The power of God is available to every single one of us. The power of God has the power to change a life. And I have seen it with my own eyes in others and in myself. 
People ask me, how can you believe in a God? I look at my life and say, how can I not? I mean, come on, he is totally, radically transforming. I look at other people out there that I have seen that I, they tell me how they used to be. And they show me what they are now in Christ, and I tell you what, that is not just proof that God is alive, but that God is present in their lives. God is powerful. When I think about the 144,000, we think about who are they? Friends, God presents it in the Bible not as some kind of trivia question to figure out. He gives us this group of people in the Bible as, a, as an example of how to live in the last days. He gives us this group of the people in the Bible so that we can see what God would have, how God would have you and I to live. The 144,000 is a group of last day people who are alive when Christ returns. And they're ones who have the victory. These are overcomers. And friends, God invites you and me to be part of this group. Tonight, let's look at the 144,000. Who are they? What do they look like? How do they live? That's the question of the evening. Beginning in Revelation chapter 7, verses 1 through 3. Now, this is at the end of the seven uh, seals. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. This is the sixth seal had just just happened, okay? After these things, I saw, in fact, you know what? We better read that before we get into this. Revelation chapter 6. I want you to see this first because this brings us right up to the second coming of Jesus. People say, how do you know that these people are alive when Christ returns? Well, this is exactly how we know because Revelation chapter 6, beginning in verse 12. This is the sixth seal. Revelation chapter 6 and verse 12. I I looked when he opened the sixth seal and behold, there was a great earthquake. And the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and and the moon became like blood. And the stars of heaven fell to the earth as a fig tree drops its late figs when it's shaken by a mighty wind. Then the sky receded as a scroll when it's rolled up, and every mountain and island was moved out of its place. What's this describing? This is the second coming of Jesus. And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the commanders, and the mighty men, every slave and every free man, they hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us, and hide us from what? The face of him who sits on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of his wrath is come. And here's the question, who shall be able to stand? So the sixth plague, or sorry, the sixth seal, not the sixth plague, but the sixth Seal comes to an end as Jesus is breaking through the sky. The return of Christ is happening. The wicked are seeing it. They're realizing it. They're waking up and saying, Ah, hide us from this face of him. The wrath of God has come. But there's a group of people who are not running at this point. At least they're not running from God. They're running to him because these are the group of people that God has prepared. Are you ready to see this group of people? Are you ready to see it? Revelation chapter 7, beginning in verse 1. After these things, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, on the sea, or on any tree till... Oh, um, I'm messing something up. All right, I'm going to my Bible here because I have it right in front of me. Then I saw... Okay, I'm just missing a period. That's a associate period there. Or on any tree. Then I saw another angel ascending from the east having the, notice this, the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea, saying, do not harm the the earth or the sea or the trees till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. So what John is doing, maybe I should say what the angel is doing, is he's showing John this group of people that had prepared themselves. They had marked themselves, if you will, They've been sealed with God's seal. And these are the people who are going to be ready for Christ to return. So don't harm these folks until we have sealed the servants. First thing I want you to notice about the 144,000, we're getting ready to get into that detail. God calls them servants. Too often Christians have this idea that we are more the ones in charge. The world is here to serve us. I mean, I've talked to Christians like, I can't wait till the time whenever the, all the worlds are going to be judged by us. We're going to rule over them, and they're going to be our slaves. I'm like, whoa, where's this spirit coming from? Friends, God it wants you and me to have the attitude of a servant. Yes, yes, yes. Know that you have, you're a friend with God. Jesus said, no longer do I call you servants, but friends, right? We need to have that attitude of that friendship with God. But in our own heart, we still need to recognize that we have the submissive heart in fact, the word here, I believe, is the word doulos, which means slave. 
We need to recognize that God is our master. He is our boss. He's the one who says what to do and what not to do. We listen to him. Is that clear? The servants of our God are sealed in their foreheads. And you know what it makes me think of? All right. Keep your finger here in Revelation chapter 7. We're coming back. Flip over to the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 4. This one's going to throw you now. Isaiah chapter 4. There's a prophecy buried here in Isaiah chapter 4 that you need to see. <laughs> I read it and it just, it just it amazes me how accurate it is because this is talking about the last days. If you read the context from chapter 3 leading into chapter 4, he's talking about the daughters of Zion. Zion is a representation of Jerusalem, Judea. It's, it's God's people. The daughters of Zion is his church. All right. Now listen to what it says. In that day, this is Revel sorry, Isaiah chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. In that day, seven women shall take hold of one man, saying, We'll eat our own food. We will wear our own apparel. Only let us be called by your name to take away our reproach. Think about that for a second. This is prophecy, so prophecy has symbols. What does a woman represent in Bible prophecy? It's the church. Who is this man that's referring to here that the seven churches, by the way, seven is the number of perfection. It's a number of completion. So you see the number seven, it means all these churches, so many of them are taking hold of one man. Who's this one man? Jesus. And it says, and notice that they, what they say. We will eat our own food. What is food a symbol of in the Bible? We'll eat our own bread. What is it? The word of God. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So it says we're gonna, we would, we'll have our own word, our own Bible, our own truths, our own teachings. We will wear our own what? Apparel. Now, maybe literally they're saying we're going to wear what we want to wear. We don't care what you say. But look what happens here. What's apparel represent in prophecy? Anybody know what apparel represents or clothes? Well, it couldn't. It doesn't always mean Christ's righteousness. Because remember the filthy rags that we have of our own? Those rags represent what? Self-righteousness. And the Bible says in the book of Revelation that the fine linen, clean and white, represent the righteousness of the saints. How are they righteous? Because of Christ's righteousness. So how, depending on the apparel. So what are they saying? Christ is offering his churches his righteousness. But what are people saying? We'll have our own righteousness. We'll do it our own way. That's right. We want our own righteousness. We don't want what God offers. So again, you have all, so the, the, the interpretation here is you have all these churches wanting to have Jesus. What? He says, only let us be, do, be called what? By your name. We don't want your word and your teachings. We don't want your righteousness. We want our own word, our own teachings, our own righteousness. But what we do want is your name so we can have that ticket to heaven. You see what I'm, I'm talking about here? It, I, I don't know who said this, but ever since I heard it, I've just it, it really has stuck with me. Somebody once said that many people accept Christ as their Savior, but not as their Lord. Friends, Jesus wants us to accept Him as our Lord and Savior. Not Jesus didn't just come to save us from our sins. He came not just to save us, but to be our Lord and our Master, to lead us, to guide us, to show us the right way, right? And so God's people are servants. In fact, if you want to throw a ribbon in, in book Isaiah chapter 4, we will come back here later on in the meeting. So as we keep reading on, it says, And I heard the number of those who were sealed. So these are the sealed ones. 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel were sealed. So, who are the children of Israel? In our last presentation, we went over spiritual Israel in the last days. Who is Israel? Is it physical Jews? Are they physical Jews? Well, the problem with finding out physical Jews, because Jesus said and Paul said that physical connection with Abraham means nothing. Jesus said God can raise up stones unto Abraham. But who are the real children of Abraham? The sons and daughters of faith. If you're connected to Christ, you are the children of Abraham by faith. If you missed my message on Saturday night, you've got to go hear that message. So when we hear in Revelation, it says all the tribes of Israel was sealed. We're not talking about the physical lineage of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We're talking about spiritual Israel. 
And here's a couple of reasons we know that. Now, if you keep reading on, it says 12,000 from each tribe is sealed. Let me show you here. You got 12,000. Well, I'm not, actually, I'm, I'm skipping. I'm come, going back. We're going to come back to this next slide in just a moment. Okay, 12,000 from each tribe. Do you realize this list of 12,000, you're, if you're in Revelation chapter 7, I just closed it. If you're in Revelation chapter 7, you'll notice it lists there. All the tribes. Notice the first one, Judah, then Reuben, then Gad, then Asher, then Naphtali, Manasseh, Simeon, Levi, Issachar, Zebulun, Joseph, and Benjamin. You'll notice a couple things from this passage. There are two tribes missing. Two tribes are missing. Does anybody catch that? And do you know what those two tribes are that are missing? Dan is missing. Dan is not there. There's another one missing. Who is it? Oh, Judah's there. He's number first. He's the first on the list. Who else is there? Missing, rather. Ephraim. Ephraim is missing. Now, hold on. I'll, I'll tell you why in just a minute, at least my thought on this. But did you notice there's a tribe there that doesn't exist? In fact, there's two tribes there that is not listed in any of the 12 tribes. So if you take two out, you've got to put two in. What are the two that God puts in there? Do we know the two he took out? What's the two he put in? What is it? Joseph. Joseph is nowhere in the Bible mentioned as a tribe, and yet here he is. In fact, Joseph is the dad of Manasseh. So technically, you have two tribes in there from Joseph, right? Joseph and Manasseh. All right, what's the other one that's not in any other list in the Bible? No, Benjamin's in there. It is the tribe of Levi. Now, you know that there is a tribe of Levi, but they're never mentioned among the 12. You know why? Because in addition to the 12, God gave Levi to be the... The, 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 the teachers and trainers and, 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 and a part of the priesthood is there among the Levites. And so that, so Levi was never mentioned among the 12. They were in bonus. Remember, they didn't, have, they didn't even inherit any of the land. They got six separate cities. So why Levi and Joseph, and why take out Ephraim and Dan? Well, there's a couple reasons. Because, first of all, Dan in the Bible was, was a representation of rebellion and sin. Uh, Dan is mentioned, if you, I, I don't have time to get all the details of it, but there's, uh, that's where you know, Be, uh, Dan and Bethel, they first set up those idols back in the days of Jeroboam. Dan was this place of refuge where they went and worshipped the idols, right? That was to the north. Ephraim became a symbol of the nation of Israel. So you remember how you had Judah to the south and Israel to the north? Israel became known as Ephraim uh, because of the, the wickedness and the sin. And so, you know, God had said at one point, he said, leave Ephraim alone. He is joined to his idols. So there's a lot of idolatry connection there. So God leaves out Ephraim and Dan, and he puts in there Levi, which, you know, he wasn't accounted among the 12, but he certainly was uh, among the faithful. That's why God used them in such a powerful way. But then you also have uh, Joseph, which I'm not sure exactly why Joseph is in there, because his son Ephraim, or his son Manasseh is also in there. But here's what I do know. This list is nowhere else in the Bible. And even when we do have a list of the 12 in the Bible, they're not anywhere in this order. Why would this be such out of order? Well, uh, Pastor Doug Batchelor, um, he put out a booklet. Uh, you can read this on our Amazing Facts website, about the 144,000. But he, he showed how the meanings of the names kind of creates a significant saying. Let's go through that just for a moment. The first name, Judah, the meaning of Judah is, I will praise the Lord. Reuben is, he's looked on me. Gad, granted good fortune. Asher means I am happy. Naphtali, my wrestling, Manasseh, making me to forget. Simeon means God hears me. Levi, joined to me. Issachar, purchase me. Zebulun, dwelling. Joseph, God will add to me. And Benjamin, son of my right hand. I'll go, you were taking a picture. You want to get that first one up? I took it down so fast. And so you take these 12 sayings in this order and you put them together. You know what you find? Watch this. I will praise the Lord for he has looked on me and granted good fortune. I'm happy because my wrestling God is making me to forget. God hears me and is joined to me. He has purchased me a dwelling. Isn't that what Jesus said? God will add to me the son of his right hand. Wow. That is really neat. Now, the italicized words are the only words added. The rest of them are just the meanings of the, of the words. And so this describes the, the, the church's story of its history and its struggle and its redemption and its victory and of ultimate marriage to the Lamb as described throughout the book of Revelation. 144,000. So that, again, I think there, what we see here is clearly God is showing us this is not literal tribes. By the way, you can go around today 
and you're not going to be able to find even 12,000 people from the tribe of Gad. They don't exist. Remember the 10 tribes of the northern Israel went into captivity, into the dispersion? Even James mentioned that in James chapter 1, mentions the dispersion. The 12 tribes scattered abroad. These 12 tribes, literal 12 tribes, really aren't even around anymore. And there's even debate today about who's Jewish and who's Levi, and, and who, which are tri two tribes they say are still around today. So how do we know? Now, genetics are actually coming out and saying some things and saying, you know, there's got the Ashkenazis and the Sephardic Jews. And, and, but really, how do you know you're related to Abraham? Well, they, there's some, I'm not saying they're not. I don't, I don't know. I'm not here to argue really that point, except to say in AD 70, all those lineages were destroyed. All those paper records of who's related to who going back to Abraham, it's all gone. But how do we know? But God, I think God allowed for that, and I'll tell you why. Because having blood running through our veins that was once running through Abraham's veins, so to speak, means nothing to God. It means nothing. In the sense that the Israel that God is restoring, the Israel that God is blessing, the Israel that God is working with today is the Israel that believes in Jesus. The Israel that has accepted the Messiah. And friends, the Bible calls them Gentiles. And yes, there are physical Jews out there that can become part of that. But there's one tree, Jews and Gentiles together, not two separate ones, one that has a bigger blessing than the other. There is one spiritual Israel today, and that is God's last day church. God's last day church. And by the way, just as like in the days of the apostles, you could be cut off from God's last day church, or you could be grafted in. It's your choice. Now, going on, it says in Revelation, now, let me back up. Revelation chapter 7 goes through and gives a little bit of details about the 144,000 that they're sealed. You know, we learned about the seal of God, right? The seal of God deals with his Ten Commandments, his law, specifically the Sabbath, where God's seal is in it, right? So for you to get the seal of God in your forehead in the last days, you're going to have to choose loyalty over to God over the world. So you're only, you got two groups of people in the last days. You've got those who have the mark of the beast, and you've got those who have the seal of God. Let me address one more question before I move on. Is it a literal number? Is it exactly 144,000 people that are going to be alive when Jesus comes back that are going to be ready for him? The answer is an absolute, I don't know. But I will say this. I do lean toward it's going to be a figurative number. I'll tell you a couple reasons why. First of all, if it was a literal number, it wouldn't bother me one bit. I'll give you, I'll give you one reason why. It was eight in the days of Noah, right? Eight in the days of Noah. How many disciples did Jesus pick? He had 12, right? Well, he had the 100 and, oh, he had the, the, the 70, then the 12, then he had the 120 later on. So it was a small group compared to all the people, right? Then, praise God, 3,000 accepted and it grew. So just because it starts that way doesn't mean it ends that way, right? And some believe that the 144,000 are like 144,000 literal apostles that end up winning uh, a lot of people to Christ. I, I'm not sure about that. I'm not, I think those are 144,000 that are sealed. These are the ones who are sealed. But the, if God picked eight in Noah's day, 144,000 is quite a bit compared to eight. There was a lot, probably a billion or more people alive in Noah's day. So eight isn't a whole lot. So I'll say that if it's a literal number, here's my advice. Live like it's a literal number. Strive to be part of that small number, okay? But here's why I think it's a figurative number. This is why I'm leaning this way. You can convince me otherwise. If you want to pull me aside and say, hey, Pastor, let me tell you why I think it's literal. Okay, I'll, I'll hear you. I'll, I'll listen to you. I will even investigate it. But here's why I think it's a figurative number. First of all, it's 144,000 out of the 12 tribes. These 12 tribes are not literal 12 tribes. So why would we have a literal number but not literal tribes? So that doesn't make sense? Second reason I believe, or I'm leaning toward, I should say, that it is a figurative number is because Revelation is written in symbolic language. So almost everything in Revelation is symbols. There's a few that aren't, but generally speaking, it's a book of symbols. So I would expect it to be symbolic. And the third reason is, is because when you read Revelation chapter 7 here, it goes on to talk about, let me get, get there, it goes on to talk about a group called the Great Multitude. Now, I've studied this through and through, and I've come to the conclusion that the Great Multitude is the same group as the 144,000. The 144,000 is the group he sees still on the earth being sealed, but when he looks in heaven, he actually hears the number, it says here, uh, a great, actually, verse 9, it says, These things I looked, and behold, a great multitude which no one could number. So on earth, he hears the number 144,000. In heaven, he sees this great multitude which nobody could number. And where are they from? Every nation, kindred, tribe, and, pe tribe and people. And you go see the description of the great multitude. They match up with the 144,000. 
wearing the white robes and all these things. And so anyway, that's my case, as, sh as shallow as it may be, that the 144,000 is a symbolic number. So don't be afraid to say, oh, there's only 144,000. I might as well just give up now. I'm, I, was never, I was never picked for any sports in school, and so I'm not going to get picked now. I just might as well give up. No, no, no. All of us can strive to be on that straight and narrow gate. In fact, Jesus said, many seek to enter in but will not be able because they did not strive. We do need to strive, each and every one of us. Now, with that said, I do want to skip over to Revelation 14. So Revelation 7 and 14 are the two passages that directly talk about the 144,000. And Revelation 14 describes how they live and what's the lifestyle of the 144,000. What, what, what do they look like? If you were to try to find them, would you be able to notice them? Would they look different? Would they talk different? Would they act different? Would, what was their, what's their life like? Well, I just love verse 4 because Revelation 14, 4 epitomizes the whole story of the 144,000. It says here, these are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. Friends, if you are following the Lamb today, you can follow the Lamb right to the very end. Jesus is the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. He can take away your sin and give you the victory and make you an overcomer, just like the 144,000 were overcomers. How do we know they were overcomers? Well, let's read verse 5. It says, In their mouth was found no deceit, for they are what? Without fault before the throne of God. The book of Jude tells us that God is even able to help us to be without fault. There's two reasons we can be without fault. The first way we can be without fault is by accepting the blood of Jesus to cleanse us from our faults. Amen? The second way we can be without fault is by God giving us the power to not commit those faults. You're not without, you don't have faults if you're not making them. And Jesus does both. One is justification, making you just as if you'd never sinned. That's forgiveness. The second is sanctification, giving you power to not commit those sins anymore. Right? Making saints out of you. God can do that. The third, by the way, there is glorification. That hasn't happened yet. Nobody's been glorified. None of us have been glorified. We're not, we're not, I'm not, if you come up to me and say, hey, I'm, I'm St. Wyatt, I've been glorified. I'm, if I just turn around and run the other way, you wouldn't blame me, right? If somebody said that to me, somebody said that to you? Okay, I don't, I'm too unholy to be around somebody who's claiming to be a saint. I'm getting out of there, okay? In all seriousness, Jesus has the power to justify us, sanctify us, and one day when he comes back, to glorify us again. Revelation, or Luke chapter 9, verse 23. These are the words of Christ that explains what happens when we follow Jesus. It says, And he said to them, All, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross. How often? Daily and follow me. So Jesus is saying that we must take up our cross and follow Jesus. So when Jesus says, the, the, you know, the 144,000 follow the lamb wherever he goes, where did Jesus go whenever... He was walking. Where, where, where did his path eventually take him? To be crucified, right? And so if we're going to follow Jesus, are we also going to our crucifixions? You better believe it. The Bible says, and oh, somebody's going to correct me on this. I think it's Galatians 2.20. It says, uh, for I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I'm crucified with Christ. If you're going to take, daily take up your cross and follow Jesus. What is this talking, what's this cross talking about? It's self-denial. It's selflessness. I tell you, some people want to live the Christian life and say, I'm going to live for Jesus. Remember those women who take the one man, says we're going to eat our own bread, we're going to have our own clothes, just give us, let us be called by your name. That's how they want to live their Christian life. Give me the name Christian. I'm going to wear the name tag. I'm going to wear it nice and big so everybody can see I'm a Christian. Put me my big, my big old bumper sticker on there. Actually, I heard this story about this police officer who pulls over this car. And as he comes up to the car, he's got his hand on his gun. He says, roll your window down. Roll your window. It's in the, roll, step out of the car right now. Put your hands where I can see them. And this old lady steps out of the car. She's shaking. She's like, get out of the car. She stands, stand right there. What's your name, ma'am? Is this your car? Uh, uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. He takes a big, deep breath. He's like, all right. Let me see your license. And so anyway, he realizes this is the woman who owns the car. He said, ma'am, I thought this car was stolen. Well, well sir, why would you think that? Well, on the back, you had a bumper sticker that said, honk if you love Jesus. And yet I saw you sticking your hand out with some signals on it to some people that, and you were, I heard shouting and yelling just from where you were. And I thought somebody had absolutely had it and stole this car because 
The one who loved Jesus is not in it. Sometimes we like to wear the bumper sticker, but we don't like to have the patience of Jesus, do we? May God help us to be better. Dying to self, dying to sin on a daily basis. Paul said, I die daily. Now the Bible says here in 1 John chapter 2, verse 15, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Now, this is why tonight I asked you, I, I prepared you in advance. I gave you the warning. I said, tonight, bring some steel-toed boots because I may be stepping on some toes. But at the end, it's not really me stepping on toes. It's Jesus, right? He's the one who wrote these words. It's not me. The Bible says to love not the world. But the problem is, is and I'm just going to be honest, our natural hearts are inclined to the world. We love the world. The, the, naturally speaking, without Jesus' help, we just, we're like, Matt, we're like, uh, what are those things, um, uh, 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 ro no, not roaches. Roaches run from the light. That's, that's also true. But um, I was going to say, uh, what are those things? Those uh, mosquitoes, right? Moths, moths to the light. That's what I'm saying. Moths to the light. It's like we've drawn to, to the world. Just, it's just natural. But the thing is, God is calling us to come out of the world. It says here, if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. So I'm not here to judge anybody tonight. In fact, I'm going to share some things. I'm going to start getting specific tonight and talk about some things that this world is offering to you and really shoves in your face and tells you, you've got to do this. And I'll tell you, I'm going to talk about some of those things tonight, but I'm not, as I talk about it, it's not for you to look to the person to your left and right and front and behind you and say, oh, they need to get this. Tonight, this message is for me. Tonight, this message is for you to examine your own hearts. Can you do that? It takes, I'll tell you, it takes a great deal of humility to examine our own hearts and say, God, am I living up to this word? Am I following Jesus in this regard? It's going to be hard. I'm going to tell you right now, I've had people who've wanted to throw things after me, at me after this meeting. So, pray for me, don't throw things at me, okay? All right, so do you love the world or do you love Jesus? I believe you love Jesus tonight, and I think you're going to see why there's a separation, there's a difference. Luke 14, so likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all he hath cannot be my disciple. Is there anything in your life right now that you're not willing to give up for Jesus? I mean, maybe you're struggling. Maybe you're in that place in your life like, I don't know. Maybe I, I, the world really calls me. The really, world really wants, you know, is, is pulling me. But tonight I'm asking you to really, really consider, is there anything that's too big to give up for Jesus? If so, that thing has become an idol. Now, if God told me to sell my car, I'd be like, I'd argue with him. Lord, I ain't got one car. If I sold my car, how are we going to get here to the meetings? I got to do that for you, Jesus. I'm like, you know, we get really sharp when we start arguing with God. You know, it's like my kids, they argue with me. Woo! And they, they are so smart. Like, they come in, I never saw this one coming. They just come at an angle. I never thought they would, they would argue with me. We try to do that with God. Like, God, you know what? I need this for you. But then, if God said, get rid of the car, what are you going to do? What if it's something more personal to me? You know, something that, that I really care about. By the way, sometimes God asks you to give up good things. Do you believe that? Sometimes God keeps you from having things that you think you should have. Remember, we talked about Paul's thorn in the flesh, probably his eyesight. He's like, God, give me some good eyes, please. God said, no. He asked him three times till God said, don't, just quit asking me. I'm not giving you good eyesight. My grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in weakness. So God told him no to the good eyes. Moses, he wanted to go to the promised land. God, I, 40 years I was in Egypt. 40 years I was in the wilderness. 40 years I was with your people in the wilderness. God, please let me inherit your, your promised land. 120 years old, God says no to Moses. You're not crossing over the Jordan. What? Does God even hold back from us good things? Yes, when he has better things. In the story of Moses, you know, he ended up dying. Jesus ended up giving him a special resurrection, taking him to heaven, right? Yeah, I think he got something a little bit better than the, than the Canaan land, right? He got the real Canaan land. All right, getting off the point. Well, my point is, is that when God asks us to sacrifice something, whether it's good for us, whether it's bad for us, we need to obey. And, it, and let it be from the love of Jesus. Don't do it because you have to. Don't do it because Pastor Wyatt does it or doesn't do it. Don't do it because somebody else does or doesn't do it. No, friends, do it because you love Jesus. If you're doing it for any other reason, then you're doing it just like the Pharisees and Sadducees. Doing it to earn something. Well, if I don't do this, then I'm not going to heaven, so I better not do it. 
That's the attitude of the Pharisees. Let it be, I know what God knows what's best. I trust him. What, are we, what is standing in the way between us and God? Most people want to live, in fact, most of the religions around the world, I'm going to go so far as to say, as I know it's mean, to sound, mean sounding, but it's not, it's cheap religion. It's getting all that you want without giving anything, or hardly anything. It's, not, it's, it, it, it's, it's basically a religion without restrictions. Do you know, do you know the, one of the most restrictive uh, restrictive deals out there that, uh, how do I put this? A very restrictive contract, restrictive relationship, it's called marriage. Think about all the restrictions. I mean, right before the whole church, you're standing there before your beloved, right? And you say, I'm done. I'm forsaking all others. I mean, that's pretty, that's pretty strict. I'm not going to have any relationships with anybody else. I'm done. Sickness and in health, right? Good days and the bad days, I'm still going. And whenever we're rich or we're poor, we're still going to stick together. That's pretty restrictive. What a promise. So why is it that people come up and promise before a lot of people that they're going to abide by all these restrictions? What is it? Love. You see, love is what gives you the power. I mean, you, did I even have to think a second time? Like, oh, you know, I don't know. I got all these girlfriends out there. And I just, I just don't know. You know, I've, if I say yes to her, I'm saying no to maybe a different girlfriend later on. I don't know. This is tough. Did I have that thought? Not even for a second. I was, she was there. I could think of no one else, and I could still think of no one else. Amen? Love is what holds relationships together. But, you know, and the Bible says in the book of James, chapter 1, I think it's verse 27, it says, pure an undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. True religion is to keep oneself unspotted from the world. You know what makes people miserable? There's nothing more miserable than two people who live together who don't love each other. That's, they're miserable. And before long, they're going to end up separating. I tell you, I, I meet people who are miserable in the church. Why are they miserable in the church? Because they got all the rules but they don't have the love. That's the Pharisees. Legalism is having all the laws, but no love. If you don't have love, you don't, you, you, can, you can still obey. On the outward, you can still give your tithe. You can still go to church every Sabbath, right? You can, uh, you know, not shoot your neighbor. Like, those are good things. But if you really don't have love for God in your heart, you're just a legalist. Tonight, as I share, you don't have to do a single thing that I say, but I'm going to ask you, do everything that Jesus says, because you care for him, because you love him, because you want to please him, because he's your Lord, he's your master, amen, because he gave so much for you, he sacrificed so much for you, why would you hold out and not do everything possible for him? This is the love of God, I read this earlier, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. And the reason they're not burdensome is because we want to do that which is pleasing in his sight because we love him so very much. So let me take you to 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 16, a passage of the Bible that is not popular, okay? 1 John, and the reason I'm sharing this with you is because this is how the 144,000 live, and it's how God wants us to live today. If you want to be part of the 144,000, then we need to prepare for that. 1 John chapter 2, beginning in verse 15. Can't love Jesus and the world at the same time. Jesus says, can't love God and mammon, right? Either you'll hate the one and love the other, or you'll cling to the one and despise the other. You can't, can't love God and mammon. Okay? I think Jesus said it elsewhere. He said, you can't have, man cannot have two masters. I think it was Benjamin Franklin who said, that's the reason polygamy is wrong. Man can't have two masters. Anyway, no, I, I don't, <laughs> I'm going to get myself in trouble. Okay. 1 John chapter 2, verse 15, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone, if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God does what? Abides forever. God is calling us to come out of the world. 
In fact, it says in the Scriptures, Come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord. Touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and you shall be my sons and my daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. You can read that in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 5, around verse 17 or so. James chapter 4, verse 4. Know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God. Whoever therefore shall be a friend of the world is a what? Enemy of God. Don't let Satan come into your life under the guise of good, but it's really evil. You guys have heard of the story of, the, uh, uh, of Troy, the Trojan horse. Troy was being besieged by the Greeks. Ten years, Troy was holding out. Ten years. But finally, the Greeks said, you know what, we're out of here. And so the Greeks left. They got in their ships, they sailed. And in fact, from the walls, all the Tro Trojans can see them sailing off in the far distance. So they said, we're going to leave a gift behind. So they built this big horse, and they loved their horses. So they built this big horse out of wood, and they left it for them, and then they took off. And so they celebrated their victory. They, we got victory over the Greeks. They gave up finally. We're finally free. They opened the gates. They brought the Trojan horse into the it wasn't a Trojan horse, it was a Greek horse that became a Trojan horse, when they brought it through the gates into their city town uh, center. And there they partied and drank and got drunk all night long until in the middle of the night when it became dark, all those ships came sailing back. The Greeks had returned under the guise of night. The tro the, the, inside that horse, those men came out. They opened those gates you let the Greeks inside. That night, Troy fell. Ten years they held back, but one night, because they let the enemy into the camp. Friends, we, can't, we cannot afford, as Christians individually or as a church collectively, we cannot afford to let any of the world into our lives, lest it defile us, lest it set us up to be completely conquered. A boat is safe in the water, as long as the water's not in the boat. Jesus said in John 17, you're going to be a Christian in this world. I'm not going to take you out of this world. He says, I don't, I don't, in fact, he's praying to his father, Father, I do not pray that you take them out of this world, but that you keep them from the evil one in this world. That's the prayer of Jesus. You, a boat may be safe in the water as long as the water's not in the boat, and a Christian may be safe in this world as long as the world is not in the Christian. We're going to be surrounded by the world. I tell you, as a dad, it's hard. The world pushes, and it pushes, and it pushes. I've got kiddos that I'm trying to prevent and hold back. The world from corrupting my family, from corrupting me. But the world keeps pushing, and guess what? The world looks brighter and more beautiful every day. Oh, it, gets, it dresses up and looks good. It wants to say, come on, invite me in. Bring me in with technology. All you... As friends, we've got to stand strong and not let the world come in and corrupt us. Let's go back to 1 John 2.16. We read it earlier. For all that's in the world, it mentions three things here. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. These are three areas that Eve fell in. It's also three areas that Jesus gained the victory in in the wilderness. Do you, why don't you study that sometime? Go look at Eve. See how she failed in every one of these areas. And we'll go look at the story of Matthew chapter 4 of Jesus and his victory over de the devil. And Jesus overcame in all four of the, all three, sorry, of these areas. Three of Satan's Trojan horses that tried to come into our lives. Jesus gained the victory, and just like Jesus was an overcomer, he says you can be an overcomer too. Let's talk about the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and let's talk about the pride of life. First, let's look at the lust of the flesh. You know, the devil knows that we have five senses. I think I have a sixth sense. It's called a sixth sense of humor. But my five senses is how the devil really tries to get me, right? You got your eyes, your ears, right? Your taste, your feeling. I'm missing one. Your smell. Satan uses these to try to gain entrance into our lives. And he tries to excite our passions, our appetites, right? And that's exactly what this lust of the flesh is all about. Our appetites and our passions, desiring that which God says either no to or not that much. You understand? God says, don't, you know, like gluttony is a sin, is it not? Is it wrong to eat food? It's not wrong to eat food. It's wrong to eat too much food. So there's limits. Is sex evil? No, but God puts restrictions on sex and says it has to happen within a committed marriage relationship, okay? 
So God puts, he says, yes, but not, not too far. But some things God says, no, no, and I'm going to say it again, no. Well, there's a lot of things like, and, and by the way, it's like everything that is good, Satan tries to take it to excess, you know that? He tries to push Christians too far. Oh, it's good, just go a little further than God said go. He traps a lot of Christians that way. You have drug addictions, and you know people even have fitness addictions. Do you believe that? It's not my problem, you can tell, but it's certainly a problem a lot of people have where they actually work out to get these highs. I'm not saying it's necessarily a bad thing, but you can overdo just about anything, but a lot of alcohol addictions, sexual addictions. The Bible talks about those whose stomach is a God. Look at this. This is Philippians 3, 18 and 19. For many walk of whom I've told you often and now tell you even weeping. He's crying about this. He says that they are enemies of the cross of Christ whose end is destruction, whose God is their what? Belly. And whose glory is in their shame, who set their mind on what things? Earthly things, worldly things, okay? So, and I, and I tell you, at one time or another, probably all of us can be guilty of just listening to our stomachs, even though God was telling us, don't do it. And you're like, yes, I'm going to do it, because my belly's, that puts your belly at God, isn't it? I'm not, again, not here to judge anybody, not here to condemn anybody. We, we're, we're Christians, we're charitable, we're kind, but the fact is we need to look inward and say, how are we treating our appetites and passions? Are we denying them for Jesus' sake? Not all appetites and passions are wrong, but taken to an extreme, they can be. What about other lusts of the flesh, things that create an appetite and a passion in us? I'm going to talk about music for just a minute. This is where I start uh, meddling, some would say, and uh, ask, can music lead to the sins of the flesh, the lust of the flesh? Well, it's interesting that the origin of rock and roll uh, here uh, it all comes from sexuality. Uh, John Oates of the Hall and Oates Rock Band said, Hall and Oates, or sorry, Hall and Oates, rock and roll is 99% sex. Time Magazine, January 3rd, 1969, uh, talking about these uh, rock bands, said, in a sense, all rock is revolutionary. By its beat and sound, it has always implicitly rejected restraint and celebrated freedom and sexuality. And by the way, we have listened, I'm not necessarily you, maybe you grew up in the church and you've been safe from all of this, but I grew up listening to all this music so much that it became very normal to me, and it didn't sound rough at all, and yet, this is exactly what has happened. Rolling Stone Encyclopedia of Rock and Roll says, Rock and Roll, the term is a blues euphemism for sexual intercourse. I'm not just picking on rock and roll today. Believe me, there's a lot of other genres of music, uh, whether it's hip-hop or rap music or uh, there's alternative. I can't, there's so many you can't even list all the different kinds. Country music. Oh, I'm here in Arkansas. I'm probably going to get really big in trouble if I mention country music. You know, country music is, is a lot of these music, you know what they say? I say, if you play country music backwards, you get your wife back, you get your house back, you get your dog back, you get out of jail, you know? A lot of, this, this country music, is, does, it, does it lift you up? Does it draw you closer to Jesus? Or does it really draw you closer to the world? A lot of it's just depressing music. And I'm just talking, that's just the lyrics. I'm not even talking about the beats and things. There is, a, there is an effect, even just the beats, even apart from the actual words themselves. Did you know there's an effect in that kind of music? I'm telling you what, there's an absolute effect. Science has shown it. You can actually go and, and look at this eight-week music study that was done. It's recorded in, the, in Neil Nedley's uh, book, Proof Positive, uh, the first edition. And anyway, group one, group two, and group three. The first group was, uh, what they did is they took these mice, okay? They have these different groups of mice, and they put them in a maze. And the, and the test is, how fast can you get to the cheese, okay? But they were playing different kinds of music to, and see what kind of effect it had on the mice in their, in their search for the cheese. The first one, they had this disharmonic drum beats. They had this, you know, da -dum, da -dum, da -dum, all these beat music, this rock music, this, and, then, and so they were trying to find the cheese. Okay? The second group was this classical music, very harmonic music, har harmonic music, and they were trying to find the cheese. The third group was control group, no, cheese, or no music at all in their search for the cheese. So it, over these eight weeks, you know what they found? Here's, here, I'm going I'm to read this to you. It says, uh, all the mice went through the standard maze test with food at the end of the maze. On the first day, all three groups performed equally well. They groped about the maze and searched for food. By the end of the eight weeks, however, it was noted that the second and third groups had learned the direct path to the food. They know right where that cheese is. They're hungry. They're going to get it. Boom. The rock group, however, was still groping for it, taking much longer to find the food than the other two groups. 
Sometimes we wonder, why is it that we're having a hard time finding what we're looking for? Seeking you shall find, Jesus says, but why can't we find? Could it be that we are setting ourselves back and up for uh, lack of success when we're not doing it God's way? Are we allowing the world to influence us? So, but then there followed a three-week break in their maze training without music, all of them, no music, followed by a maze retest to see how much knowledge they had retained in the maze's course and to see if the effect of the rock beat had worn off. Again, the rock group performed poorly. They continued having difficulty remembering how to get to their food, while the other two groups still found it quickly. The rock group seemed almost to be starting from scratch. They groped around for groped around and seemed disoriented. Both the control group and the, disharm and the harmonic group, on the other hand, could run the maze consistently faster, proving that their learning has stuck. Here was the conclusion by Dr. Nedley. He said, this could help explain why rock music listeners are more prone to use drugs and engage in extramarital sex, and why heavy metal listeners are much more likely to consider suicide. So when those people say, in fact, I remember I was first learning about music, and I, and I was struggling on a personal level whether or not to give up uh, rock music. I, I was a headbang, headbanger. I listened to heavy metal music, and I did not want to give it up. This is, this is probably my biggest struggle as a Christian. Like, like bigger than anything you could ever imagine. I'm like, I almost came to the point where I, I could choose Christianity or I could choose my music. I knew that God wanted me to give it up, but I didn't want to. My flesh said, please, let me have it. But God said, no. Clearly, the scripture, I mean, you just study the New Testament. It's very clear, the things that God said, says, take heed what you hear. You know, we need to really listen to what God wants us to listen to and not listen to what he doesn't want us to listen to. And so songs, hymns, and spiritual songs was a far stretch for me. Well, God was converting my heart, and I'm here to tell you God gave me the victory over that. I'm an overcomer when it comes to the area of music. Now, I'm in Walmart, and I hear one of these songs. It's like, <gasps> maybe, maybe and it's going to be stuck in my head for like the next two days. But I'm like, Jesus, take it away. Oh, help me, please. I'm like, get it clear my mind. I was, you know, amazing grace. I'll get that, you know, replace the evil with the good. Remember that? But here's the thing. Um, this kind of music has a very... A difficult effect on people, and it's, it's hard to overcome. It just, it's, it's, it's like addictive. I think it's addictive. You have these neural pathways built in your head and with the beats and all these things, and so I get it. I understand the struggle with this kind of music, but I'm telling you, if Jesus was here today, he would not just say it and teach it, but he would be listening to the kind of music that would be appropriate. I want you just to think about what would Jesus do in this situation. David Bowie said, rock has always been the devil's music. But what about what happens when we bring the devil's music into the church? You know, too often a lot of churches, they feel like we've got to entertain the young people, right? We want to keep the young people in church? We've got to entertain them. Let's, let's jazz up the music. By the way, jazz is another um, euphemism for evil things. Okay, I won't get into details on that. You can just do your research. But rock has always been the devil's music. Do we want to bring that into the church? Here's what Martin Luther King Jr. said. I appreciated his thought. He said, the profound sacred and spiritual meaning of the great sacred music or the great music of the church must never be mixed with the transitory quality of rock and roll music. This is back when rock and roll was starting to get popular. And he's like, let's not mix it. But there's people out there who feel like we've got to reach the young people this way. You know, as a young person, you could probably have entertained me. And if, if I was in another situation, maybe I'd even be drawn by it. But let me tell you, the more I got in the Bible, the less I realized, or the more I realized that this was not what God wanted for me. Satan can use music. Don't think he can't. In Daniel chapter 3, according to this passage, he used music to call everybody to come and worship the false idol. Satan uses music to control people. So don't think that he won't use it in your life. So we have to be careful. Now, again, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be clear. I am not against music. I'm a big fan of music. I think there's a lot, there's power in music. And it has a way to bless Christianity, to bless His people. We use music in praising God, worshiping Him. But make sure that music we do is holy music. Now, I'm not going to tell you this is exactly, this is, this is your list of approved songs. No, I'm not going to do that, okay? But what I am going to do is tell you, search for the principles that, to where you find music to be uplifting and drawing you closer to Jesus. Notice the 144,000? It says here, they heard harp, sound of harpists playing their harps, and they sung, as it were, a new song before the throne. 144,000, they know good music, right? And uh, this is a group of people that we want to emulate. Sing the new song, the song with harp that you can, you can enjoy with a harp. Some of this music, you couldn't hear the harp if they were playing it. As loud, loud as they possibly could, you couldn't even hear the harp. Revelation 14, 4, remember, this 144,000 are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. 
Looking at the lust of the eyes now, uh, this is another passage that, uh, now I'll tell you, I'm, I'm going to get through tonight's message. If you got to go, I'll, I'll let you go, but I'm telling you, stick through, be a little bit longer tonight, but this message can change and will change by God's grace your life. What is the lust of the eyes? It's another way the devil tries to come in using our senses. Um, the Bible principle says in 2 Corinthians 3.18 that by beholding we become changed. Uh, it says the good and a bad pr good principle and a bad principle. Well, let me phrase it differently. This principle works for both bad and good. If you look to Jesus, you become like Jesus. That's why I tell you camp out in the gospel. Study Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Get to know Jesus through the gospels. The other reality is also true that if you look to the world, you're going to become like the world. Now, what is the devil trying to put in front of us to look at the world? Oh, I'm going to tell you. All kinds of things. Now, I'm going to talk first about pornography, the lust of the eyes. Did you know that 90% that of 8 to 16-year-olds who view, 8 to 16-year-olds view pornography on the web? 90%. They're supposed to be there doing homework. What are they doing? Looking at things they shouldn't. This, has, this one thing alone has caused a tragedy across this nation where young people become lifelong addicted to pornography, where they grow up seeing women get abused, they abuse other women, where they see women as objects. By the way, this is not something that just affects men. It also affects women as well. But the truth is, pornography is rampant, and it destroys lives. Dr. Dolph Zillman said, the negative effects of pornography has been more consistently proven than the links between smoking and lung cancer. They've shown that pornography will actually shrink your brain. And because Christians who practice this, 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 this self-abuse, they are actually shutting down what the Holy Spirit can do to speak to the heart and mind. God, I, I can't even imagine what God thinks as he sees this generation where the greatest amount of internet traffic is pornography. I, I could go on and on, but I'll tell you something. The 144,000... Pure. People who have their minds set on Jesus. In fact, these were the ones who were not defiled with women. Now, in Revelation, a woman represents a church, in this case, a false church. These, these 144,000 are not mingled, they're not mixed up with Babylon and the daughters of Babylon, okay? I think that's the primary meaning of this passage. But I'll tell you something 144,000, they have their eyes on Jesus, and they're not looking at pornography. The lust of the eyes. What about television? You know, there's, uh, by age 16, 200,000 acts of violence have been witnessed. By age 18, 50,000 murders or attempted murders are witnessed on TV. And, you know, and you, people want to watch. Why is there so many school shootings? And people, oh, we just don't know. we got to find the root of this. What? Let's get rid of the guns. That's the solution. <laughs> Friends, we just need to pause and think that people become changed by what they look at. They will become like what they look at. You watch TV and violence all day long, you're going to become violent. 80% of sexual relationships on TV are extramarital. Do you think Hollywood is trying to establish and, and set up what, uh, and by the way, this is an old statistic. It's probably even worse right now. Not only is it extramarital, now you've got what, what used to be probably like you know, one token LGBT person on there. Now it's like half of them are LGBT. A person watching TV today would think that half the country is LGBT. And it's still down where 1, 2%, 80% extra. The world is not promoting Christian values. But why do we enjoy it so much? Paul talks about not only do they do it, but they enjoy those who do it. Romans chapter 1, I think, at the end. There's a young man who was a star of a hit TV show called Two and a Half Men. His name was Angus T. Jones. He was studying the Bible. He became convicted. He became a Seventh-day Adventist, actually. But as he was studying the Bible, look what happened. If you watch Two and a Half Men, he said, please stop watching it and fill in your head with what? Filth. People say it's just entertainment. And that's, I hear that all, it's just entertainment. Do some research, he says, on the effects of television and your brain. And I promise you, you'll have a decision to make when it comes to television, especially with what you watch. You cannot be a true God-fearing person and be on a television show like that. I know I can't. I'm not okay with what I'm learning, what the Bible says, and being on that television show. $350,000 per episode. That's a big paycheck. He says, I can't do it anymore. I can't do it. 
I can't be on a show like that. Now, how, how is it that he's going to sacrifice $350,000 an episode to get off of a TV show like that, and, but we can't sacrifice not actually watching it? And guess what? We don't pay anything, or we don't get paid anything, I should say. We pay to actually do it. Most people do anyway. Friends, we've got to be very careful. Should we be watching TV? Psalm 101, verses 2 and 3 says, I will walk within my house with a perfect heart. I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. What is it that people set before their eyes most of the time? Now, it used to be television. I think now it's their phone. You can get TV on your phone. Could it be that God is calling us in this last generation of Earth's history? I hope it's the last generation. Could it be that God's calling us to evaluate the things that we're watching? Now, can God use TV? He sure has. In fact, there's a lot of people going to be in heaven because of TV. Because they turn on the television, they heard some preacher on there tell them that God loves them. That God has a plan for their life. That there's a plan of salvation through Jesus, His Son. There'll be people in heaven because of that. And praise God for it. But I'm going to tell you, the majority, that TV has done more destruction than good. Praise God for all the good it's done. But woe to those who watch these things and imbibe in the world and become part of the world themselves. They love the world. The Bible says those who love the world, the love of the Father is not in them. Now, somebody said, but yeah, but the TV's not in the Bible. I'm going to show you a Bible verse that has, the, has TV in it. You ready for this? Here's the TV. All right? Turn. There's your T. Turn away mine eyes from beholding vanity. There's your V. Turn from vanity and quicken thou me in thy way. Establish thy word unto thy servant who is devoted to thy fear. You see it? Did you catch TV in there? Turn from vanity, but to do what? Turn away from vanity to do what? Establish in his word. I meet Christians all the time. Oh, I wish I knew the Bible like you did. I'm not puffing myself up here, but you know why? I know the Bible like I do. When I was in prison, I was there for uh, about a year. My dad sends me a $200 gift for my commissary. I said, $200? That's how much a TV costs. <laughs> You get, you, you inmates get little, TV, little, little TVs, little clear TVs, you know, and go up there to the commissary. I pay my 200 bucks. I get my TV. I put it on my shelf. I plug it in. And I'm like, yeah. I was already a Christian at this time. And I'm like, but I'm only going to watch the news. I'm only going to watch Discovery Channel. Or, the, you know, the next thing you know, what happens? Oh, what's this? This looks interesting. This commercial comes on. Oh, what's that? Oh, what's that? The next thing I know, I'm watching the same thing everybody else is watching. I start watching the movies. I start watching the TV shows. And I tell you, the Spirit of God convicts me. Wyatt, did I tell you to get a TV? Ow. And I realize this is becoming a snare to me. So I start just, I said, look, here's what I'm going to do. Amazing Facts comes on television every Sunday morning at 530. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take my TV. I unplug it. I put it underneath my bunk. It stays there all week long. I pull it out Sunday morning, 515, pull it out, plug it in, turn it on. I catch 30 minutes of amazing facts every week. Oh, it's over. Okay, unplug, turn it around, put it back under my bunk. Whole week. That worked pretty good until I got a cellmate who had his own TV. That didn't work out too good. Next thing I know, I'm doing this. Got my Bible here. I'm like, you, you realize that's, that's the lust of the flesh. That's the lust of the eyes. It draws you. You have to be prayerful, right? You have to be searching God. And, and then, I, then I got a different cellmate one time, and he didn't have a TV, and he got mad at me. Like, you got a TV you ain't going to put on a shelf. We're going to watch this thing together. I'm like, brother, I'm not doing I took my TV, and I got rid of it. I said, throw that thing away. I got rid of my TV. All most of my years, locked up, I had no TV. And I'm not here to brag about my experience. It's just to say that I realized that was a snare to my soul. And I, and I, couldn't, I, I could not fill my mind with this book and that at the same time. And I'm not saying everything on there is bad. I'm not saying even spend some time on there is bad. But I'm telling you, if you find that it's pulling you away from this book, whether from what you're watching or how much you're watching it, you've got a decision to make, just like that brother said. So I'm going to encourage you, turn off the TV and open your Bible. Start memorizing Scripture. I guarantee you this. You know people have memorized what time their favorite show comes on. You can memorize Bible verses. You know your favorite characters. You probably know the actors' names. You can memorize where things are at in the Bible and how to find them. Your brain has the capacity if you would just give it some room. All right? I hope nobody feels condemned here. I'm not trying to condemn anybody. I'm trying to encourage you and get you excited about the Bible. Amen? 
But what comes from Hollywood? Hollywood is not trying to fill your mind with this. And by the way, how do you know what's good or bad to watch on TV? Well, a couple things I'd point out. Number one, is it drawing you? Is it making you a better Christian? Is it making you more informed about things you should know as a Christian? Those are, that's a good test. Another one is you can look at Philippians chapter 4 and verse 9. It says, whatsoever things are true. Okay, that, that test right there will rule out just about 99% of TV. <laughs> Whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are... I need to go back and memorize. I used to have this written on my TV when I had it. I put that Bible verse on my TV. It goes on to say, whatsoever things are of good report. If there's any virtue, if there's anything worthy of praise, think on these things. Let that be your test. So, if you have a TV addiction, I got a solution. Okay, guys, this is... And I can even help you with this. There's, a, there's, a, there's an addiction. It's, it's, a, it's really, it's a very quick, swift, easy solution to a TV addiction. It's called a hammer. It really works. One blow gets rid of the devil's distraction once and for all. If that's your trouble. Now, if, you're, if you have the self-control and you can do that, you have, praise God, not a problem for you. But if it's a snare to your soul, Jesus said, it's better for a man to pluck out an eye and be entered into heaven than to go uh, with two eyes into hell, right? So... If this is something that needs to be plucked out, it may feel like plucking an eye out. But by God's grace, do it if it's what's ensnaring you. And so, I'm, and I'm not even going to get into video games. I'm just going to mention that that's, I was addicted to video games. It's where, uh, and I don't play games now. I mean, I, I don't even think it's wrong to play Tetris, but I'm telling you something. Because, you know, there's no, there's like brain games, you know. But I know how addictive it is. I know my personality. I get into Tetris, next thing I know, it's become competitive, and I'm on, I don't, I don't even play it. Some people can handle that. I can't. The Bible says, keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life, in Proverbs chapter 4, in verse 23. Revelation 14, 4, what is it? Though, it says, those who follow the Lamb, these are the ones, the 144,000 are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. Now, I'm going to talk about Satan's favorite sin. This is my last one I'm going to talk about tonight, but it's my hardest one I'm going to talk about tonight, because the tough thing about pride is, none of us think we have it. Because if you are humble enough to admit you have pride, well, then you're getting rid of your pride. But the chances are is that we're proud, too proud to admit we have pride. That's the danger of pride. You don't feel your need, so you don't ask for the help you need to get rid of it. But if we have pride in our life and it's beginning to show in our life, we need to deal with that, okay? All right, so we're gonna, maybe I should pause and pray. Lord, give us humble hearts tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, so I'm going to talk about the pride of life. Now, this was Satan's first sin, right? This was where Satan first fell from heaven. God's not taking people to heaven who are proud. It's not going to happen. We talk about smokers, and we talk about, uh, you know, people who commit adultery, and we talk about drinkers, and uh, we, we give these people a hard time. But you know what? Not every sin people can see and smell. Some sins are in here, okay? Now, they will show themselves eventually. You, pride comes out. You see it in Nebuchadnezzar. You see it, you know, remember, God warned Nebuchadnezzar about pride. And he held it back. He held it back. Then one day he's like, ha, ha, see all this that I had made for my glory? Yeah, it eventually comes out. You can't hold in pride too long. <clears throat> but Satan was a prince of pride. And God can overcome this sin in our life just like he can every other sin. Do you believe it? Do you, do you, we started off by talking about how God's powerful. Do you still believe that? Is that? I mean, we've come a long way from there. Do you still believe that God is all powerful, that he can make you an overcomer? Okay. So, <laughs> establish that. The Bible says in Philippians 2, 5, let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus our Lord. Have the mind of Christ. Have the mind of humility. That's what this passage is talking about, to have the mind of Christ. Now, I'm going to talk about an aspect of pride that people, that the churches used to talk about. In fact, all churches used to talk about this, but you don't hear sermons about it anymore because it's not popular, and, you, and people are afraid of, you know, being judgy, and you don't want to run anybody off, and, and you know, People will take, people are very sensitive, and so pe preachers don't talk about this. But I'm going to talk about it tonight. I'm going to share a few Bible verses that is going to talk about an area um, that, frankly, I used to struggle with, a lot of people struggle with, and it's regarding body image. Here's what the Bible says, 1 Peter 3, 3. Whose adorning, let it not be that outward adorning of plating the hair and of wearing of gold or putting on of apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart, in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. What's he mention here? He mentions the outward adorning, the plating of the hair. That's when you weave things into your hair. 
wearing of gold, putting on of apparel. God says the ornaments he wants you to wear is what? A meek and quiet spirit. I'm going to talk about cosmetics and jewelry because the Bible does. And again, I'm not, I'm, I'm not trying to breeze through things because it's uncomfortable. I want to talk about it because the Bible does. Does the Bible mention cosmetics and jewelry? I'm talking not just to the women tonight. I'm talking to the men too because you can tell men have an issue with this issue as well. Now, there are those who go to extremes. But my question is this. How much is too much? You think that's too, okay, no way, nobody in here is questioning whether this is too much. Okay, I think we've established that. But the question is, here's another one here, people putting things subderminally under their skin, putting hooks in their nose like a bull. And so, by the way, if I came to this meeting tonight with a nose, a bar through my nose, and bumps coming out my head, how long would you stick around for? Whoop, you, that, that's the definition of repentance. It's the 180, the turnaround. I'm, not, I'm going this way, now I'm going that way. I would too if somebody was preaching like that. Now listen, I don't judge folks like this, right? I don't, I don't say this God can't save this person. I'm not even putting this on the screen to make fun of these people. I'm just putting it up there to show the length of which this world has pushed people to where now this is looked at as normal, acceptable. And for you to talk bad about this is for your judging. You're, you're, you're unchristian. I'm not going to let the devil put me in that corner. I'm going to talk about what the Bible talks about, even if it does make me a little bit uncomfortable. And it probably makes me a little bit more uncomfortable, the fact that, well, jewelry, makeup typically does apply to women. And guess what? I'm not. You don't have to guess. I'm just going to tell you. I'm not a woman. Okay? I know what the definition of a woman, and I'm not one. That being said, I've got to be faithful to the Word. Again, my, my question tonight is, what is most pleasing to Jesus? I'm not here to try to tell people what to do. You don't have to do anything I say. But I'm telling you, if you want to follow Jesus and do what's pleasing to Him, it may call for a change in our life. And what I'm going to share is tonight is not for anybody else except those who want to be pleasing to Jesus, okay? Um, here's some passages. We're going to go through a few passages. 1 Peter 3, 3 and 4, we just read that. He said, don't put on the outward adornment, but let your adorning be on the inside. Uh, Genesis chapter 35, verses 2 through 3. This is a story in the Old Testament. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Well, the story is of Jacob after he had, you know, Isaac, you remember Isaac, uh, the servant of Isaac, put up a lot of jewelry on uh, uh, Re Re uh, Rebecca. Rebecca became Isaac's wife later on, loaded her up with some jewelry, right? And even Isaac. Uh, sorry, not even Jacob, rather, that wasn't holding back on the joy. But watch this. The Bible says, then Jacob, this is after his revival. He had talked to God. He had a renewal with the Lord. It says, then Jacob said unto his, and to all who are with him, put away the strange gods that are among you, and be clean, and change your garments. There's a lot of lessons there. We're going to move on. And let us arise and go to Bethel, and I will make there an altar unto God, who answered me in the day of my distress. Remember the Remember that dream he had? He has had his head on the rock and that angels ascending and descending. He's going back to Bethel. He's having this reconversion experience. When he was with Laban, wasn't always doing everything right. But now he's having this reconversion experience. He says, I'm with me in the day, way in which I would went. And they gave unto Jacob all the strange gods which were in their hand. Can you imagine? They were allowing idolatry in. But it says it was in their what? Hands. How did he get it in their hands? And their earrings which were in their ears. And Jacob hid them under an oak, which is by Shechem. So somewhere out in Shechem, there's an old tree, probably an old tree stump by now. Down below that tree is a big cache of jewelry and false gods that they were wearing in their ears, in their nose, on their fingers, around the wrists and ankles. All these jewelry, all this pagan... By the way, the jewelry in the Bible had two connotations. One of them was paganism. You wore your pagan, you wore your, you wore your gods. And that's how jewelry really got started, is people were flashing off saying, this is the God I worship. They were declaring their gods. And then they would also be associated with pride. So for pride and paganism, God said, take it off. Jacob said, take it off. And they did, and they took it, and they buried it. This is in the book of Genesis. When there was a revival that took place, God would always bring his people back. Here's another example of that, Exodus chapter 33. You guys know the story. They came out of Egypt. You may skip through this when you're reading the story, but don't skip this. They came out of Egypt. Moses went up in the mountain to get the Ten Commandments. They came back down, right? And they were worshiping what? A golden calf. Where did they get all that gold from? 
The Bible says they got all their jewelry. They made a golden calf from their jewelry because the idol, there were already many idols. They just put them together and make a big idol. And then, notice what happened. Moses came down. He breaks the Ten Commandments physically. And then he talks to the people. And the people were in trouble. Here's what it says. Exodus 33. I'm going to open my Bible here to it and read it for you. Exodus 33. It says here, back up, verse 4 through 6. And when the people heard this bad news, basically God said, you're stiff-necked, I'm going to judge you. When people heard this bad news, they mourned, and no one put on his ornaments. Why didn't the people put on their ornaments? It says why. For the Lord said to Moses, say to the children of Israel, you're a stiff-necked people. I could come up in your midst in a moment and consume you. Now, therefore, take off your ornaments that I may know what to do with you. So the children of Israel stripped themselves of their ornaments by Mount Horeb. I mean, if you saw them coming out of Egypt, right, they were wearing all their ornaments. Did God still love them? He sure did. He cared about them, but he had a plan for their life. He was going to separate them from the ways and lifestyle of Egypt, the Egyptians, right? And in fact, the Egyptians are what gave them all these ornaments to begin with. Remember, they went out with great riches, they, but they decided to put all these, this jewelry on. And so they were, they were shining and glittering. That, that fire by night, boy, they just lit up and sparkled everywhere they went. But now they were in trouble. Now they were in judgment time. And God said, take it off. Take it all off. Do you think they obeyed? Oh, yeah. They, they're like, we're getting judged. They stripped it all off, right? And God, made, and you can keep reading, God made him grind it into powder. They threw it in the water, made him drink it. Many people died as a, as a plague as a result of this. God told them to do that. Now, God, the intention of God was to use all that jewelry to do what? To build the tabernacle, right? To use it for the gold and the silver and the, all the instruments of the tabernacle. But instead, they use it to glorify themselves, not to glorify God. Hosea chapter 2 and verse 13. There's some very strong language. I'm not even giving you all the verses. There's tons of verses in the Bible about this. I don't know how some people have never read these before. And I get it. And tonight when you leave, you'll have a booklet that will even give you more, more verses. But watch this now. I will punish her for the days of the bales to which she burned incense. By the way, she's talking about God's people. This is not the pagans. This is the church. He says, I'll punish her for the days of the bales to which she burned incense. She decked herself with her earrings and jewelry, and she went after her lovers, but me she forgot, says the Lord. You recall Revelation chapter 17, the scarlet harlot? What was she wearing? Lots and lots of jewelry. In fact, the Bible uses the phrase, she was decked with it. Because this is the way the false churches were known, by the way they lived. Isaiah 3, 16 through 21. I told you we're going to go back to Isaiah. I want to read this passage. And again, I, please bear with me. I'm going to, I don't want to rush too, too fast through this. I am trying to wrap it up. Isaiah chapter 3. Remember the passage about the seven women taking hold of one man, saying we're going to eat our own bread, we're going to have our own apparel, only let us be called by your name. Well, the Bible gives some more details about these women. Okay, This is how you distinguish God's people from Babylon and the daughters of Babylon. Here it is, Isaiah chapter 3, beginning in verse 15, verse 15, sorry, verse 16, moreover the Lord says, because the daughters of Zion are haughty, what's another word for haughty? Proud, right? Because the daughter, by the daughters of Zion, is that the pagans or the church? Daughters of Zion is a phrase of the church. The daughters of Zion are haughty, they walk with outstretched necks and wanton eyes, walking and mincing as they go, making a jangling with their feet. Verse 17, therefore the Lord will strike her with a scab, the crown of her head, the crown of the head of the daughters of Zion, and the Lord will uncover their secret parts. In that day, the Lord will take away their finery, the jingling anklets, the scarves, and the crescents, the pendants, and the bracelets, and the veils, the headdresses, the leg ornaments, the headbands, the perfume boxes, the charms, and the, what's it say? The rings. The nose jewels. Now, it's so interesting to me that when I was growing up, I didn't know a single person who had a nose jewel. Not a, now, if you go to India, they, they did. But you, here in this country, not a single person had a nose jewel. Now, I'll tell you something. You can hardly go anywhere without a single person not having a nose jewel. Now, did God see this? Did, did God know that this was what the last generation is going to look like? What about the rings? People have rings on every single finger these days. And toes. When I was in India, oh, they, they jingled when they walked. They literally, their, their bangles were just jingling in their hands and their feet. And they had rings on every toe and finger. Verse 22. The festival apparel, the mantles, the outer garments, the purses, the mirrors, the fine linen, the turbans, and the robes. And it goes on. Now, look, now skip on down. Back to chapter 4. It says in verse uh, 3, it says, And it shall come to pass that he who is left in Zion, okay, 
and the remains in Jerusalem will be called holy. Everyone who is rewarded, or, or sorry, recorded among the living in Jerusalem. He says, my people are going to be holy, but watch. When the Lord has washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion and purged the blood of Jerusalem from her midst by the spirit of judgment, that's what happened in Moses' day, remember that? The, God, the people were being judged. The spirit of judgment and by the spirit of burning. So what do we see here? God is calling these things that, that tend to feed our flesh, he calls them filth. I didn't make that up. That's not my sayings. By the way, i, I, I got to say this. The, the high priest. Every year, the high priest would go into the most holy place once a year, right? That was on the day of atonement. Did you know that that high priest, during the year, every day, the high priest would wear a bonnet on his head, and that would have a golden crown that said, Holiness of the Lord. Did you know that? Did you know that he had a chest plate that had 12 jewels on it? One jewel for every tribe of Israel, plus two more jewels on the shoulders that represented six for this tribe, six for that, or six tribes for this jewel, six tribes for that jewel. Plus, he had the Urim and the Thummim. The high priest was decked out. Woo! He had some jewelry on, didn't he? Now, I mean, he literally had jewels because it was all jewels. When God puts jewelry on you, you can wear jewelry. When you put it on yourself, you're stepping outside God's guidance, right? Watch what happens. On the Day of Atonement every year, the high priest takes off the golden band on his forehead. He takes off the gemstones off his chest. He takes the gemstones off of his shoulders, and he wears a simple white linen garment. When he goes into the most holy place every year, he's very simply dressed. He's representing Jesus. I want to show you something. We are living in the Day of Atonement. This period of history right now is the Day of Atonement. God is calling his people to be simple people, to live simply, to not let the world attract, draw us. Now, were those jewels wrong that the high priest put on? No. Does God love jewels? He sure does. I mean, think about it. The foundations of the new Jerusalem is all going to be jewels, right? Praise God. This is not a bad thing. You got, the, the gates are going to be made of what? Pearls. Those are big oysters. God doesn't have a problem with jewelry. He doesn't have a problem with gold. We're going to walk on it. It's pavement in heaven. Gold isn't the problem. It's when we put it on a corrupt human heart, there's a tendency toward pride. When we get to heaven, by God's grace, you'll have given up pride. You can have gold. You can have gold everywhere. In fact, God's going to put on you a golden crown. But until that day, friends, God is calling his people in the last days to rid their heart of pride, any remnants of paganism, to live a simple life. Should our beauty come from what we put on? Does our beauty come from within, within our hearts? A real beauty, by the way, just in case anybody is going to question this, you're beautiful. Just as you are, you're beautiful. If anybody tells you you're not beautiful, you come talk to me. I'll tell them they're beautiful. You're beautiful just as you are. You don't need anybody to add anything to your beauty. The way God made you, you're beautiful. You guys know this guy here? Oh, Bob Ross. Everybody knows the master painter, Bob Ross. I want you to imagine Bob Ross gives you a painting. Oh, it's a beautiful masterpiece, a work of art. So awesome. But he gives you that piece of artwork, and you say, no, Bob, it looks pretty good. But it needs a little bit of lipstick here, a little bit of earrings here in the mountains, a little tattoo up on the clouds. Now, Bob, now it's a masterpiece. We have improved on this painting. What, do, what would you say? What do you, what do you think Bob would say if you took his painting and you did this to it? My friends, the way God made you is a masterpiece. You don't need to add these things to it to make you more beautiful. Now, I get it. In all, in all sincerity, if, if Bob Ross came in and somebody scratched his painting and it had a big scar across it and you went and touched it up with a little something, there's nothing wrong with that. Touch up. Make it look natural. But when you add things to it to accentuate things, to draw attention to things, that's where there's a problem. Now, again, am I making this stuff up or is this the Bible? This is the Scriptures. You recognize this guy? Oh, yeah. This guy is known for his gold. But you know, in 2005, after the Hurricane Katrina came through, he said, I'm going to explain why I don't wear gold anymore. When Hurricane Katrina hit in 2005, I watched people lose their lives, homes and land. As a Christian, I felt it would be a sin before God for me to continue to wear my gold. I felt it would be insensitive and disrespectful to the people who lost everything. So I stopped wearing my gold. The gold doesn't make me who I am. I don't need it. The only gold I have now is the gold in my heart. He says, I got Jesus. I don't need that outward adornment anymore. And if Mr. T can take it off, I pity the fool who keeps it on. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 9. Look at, listen to how clear. Now, 
Some people say, oh, that's Old Testament stuff. Well, that Peter passage wasn't Old Testament. But look what Paul says. Peter, Peter made it very clear. Paul makes it really clear as well. He says, in like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety. That word shamefacedness means, you know, recognizing that nakedness is not good, you know. And sobriety. Not with broidered hair or gold or pearls or costly array. Now, does God say not? That means don't, right? And yet, why do Christians, who, who know the Scriptures say these things, maybe, maybe some Christians don't know the Bible says this, or they never paused and reflected or meditated on this. But the Bible, you can't get around. There's not, there's not like you can read this and say, well, not doesn't mean not. You can't really get around that. In fact, I'm going to ask you, how much is not of not is God okay with? I'm just telling you, we, we, we shouldn't try to, too many people try to walk the edge. you got a cliff right here, and you're like trying to get as close to the edge of the cliff. Whoa. Where would God have us walk? Away from the cliff. We don't need to be walking right on the edge and see how close we can get to the world without being worldly. Christians should be Christians. They should be known as Christians. They should be able to be seen as Christians. You see somebody living this way, you should say, that's a Christian. So how much is not, is God okay with? So somebody, now, I'm going to answer a question in advance. Somebody always asks me this question, so I'm going to deal with this question. Does the Bible deal with the question of wedding rings? Okay, what about wedding rings? Well, I'm going to talk about that just for a second, not because I like to, because, again, oh, I always hear it over this one, but I'm going to talk about it anyway. Um, I don't ask how little I can do for Jesus. I ask how much I can do for Jesus. When I read the Bible says not, I believe he means not. He mentions gold and he mentions rings. A wedding ring is gold and it's a ring. So for me, it's just it's not really an issue. Here's a few reasons why I choose not to wear a wedding ring. Wedding ring, first of all, there's no biblical sacredness to a wedding ring. You, you can read the Bible, Genesis, Revelation. Nowhere is a wedding ring mentioned. So for people who say, oh, it's a sacred circle. It represents eternity. Well, you're not married for eternity. That's a Mormon doctrine. Okay, it's till death do you part. Now, it might be that you get to heaven and you're still with, you know, you recognize your husband or your wife and you're still got that love relationship, but it's not the same, right? Some people get remarried and they get to heaven and both their wives are there. What's going to happen now? Oh, that's a mess, okay? God, Jesus said, leave that subject alone. We don't have all the details. God's going to answer that, right? Now, that being said, personally, I think, by the way, you're, you're going to have a special relationship. I'm, I'm going to know who my mom is, my kids are. It's not like you don't, but the relationship is a pure Christian love relationship, right? There's not a continual reproduction. In the Garden of Eden, God said, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. What was God's plan when the earth was full? I think God was going to, if Adam never sinned, I think God was going to say the earth is full. Okay, no more reproduction. And I think that's kind of the plan of the new heavens and new earth. Everybody's there is going to be there. No need for more reproduction. We're just, you know, so that's, that's why marriage is, anyway, I'm getting a lot deeper than I meant to go on that one. So, why I choose not to wear a wedding ring? Because the origin of the wedding ring is pagan. There's actually like three different stories of the origin of the wedding ring. All of them are pagan. It goes back to the Egyptians and when the women were used to be slaves. And so the women would put a ring on to recognize who their masters were. And now the women, but did you realize it was less than 100 years ago that men started wedding, wearing wedding rings? Is, is it, you look it up. It was after World War II, or actually during World War II, when, when the men would go off to war and they're like, well, you know, we got to, you know, show that I'm married. So they start putting on wedding rings when they went off to war. Before that, around the world, no men wore wedding rings. Only the women wore the wedding rings. <laughs> this is just really interesting. It's a less than 100 years old phenomena, and people are stuck on it like this is some kind of biblical teaching, and the Bible doesn't say anything about it. It is an ordinance of the world. The world expects it. Does God expect it? No, God does not expect it. Are you, just, are, are you breaking your vows if you take off your wedding ring? Not at all. You're not breaking your vows at all. You didn't promise with that wedding ring that say, you know, as long as I'm wearing this, I'll be faithful. I'm going to take it off, and now I'm not going to be faithful anymore. That wedding ring does not keep people faithful. You understand? In fact, I had a friend tell me, he was a cellmate. He said, well, when I went to the bar, I, put, I wasn't married. I put a wedding ring on. I said, why would you put a wedding ring on? Because women are looking for men with wedding rings. They want to keep it quiet. I'm like, wow, the world is really bad. I'm glad I got taken out of the world and went sent to prison where I got to be safe and learn about Jesus. I won't wear a wedding ring because it's gold and it's jewelry and it's, it's a ring. The Bible says on both of those not to. And this is the first step toward other jewelry. It's the gateway jewelry. You know, it's the one that, you know, you, you, historically churches didn't wear wedding rings. Christians didn't wear wedding rings. In fact, if you ever, 
I don't recommend watching TV. I watch too much of it. Sorry, but there's a movie called Braveheart out there where when they exchanged vows, they did a little ribbon they wrapped around the wrists. They didn't do it. Protestants didn't wear wedding rings. It was a Catholic institution that came in from the pagans, and Protestants said, we're not Catholic. We're not going to do that. But then they brought on the wedding ring, and next thing you know, what happened? It was the earrings, then it was the necklaces, then it was toe rings, and now it's nose rings, and now it's eyebrow rings, and whew, it's gateway jewelry. And finally, God's people didn't wear it for 5,000 years, and I don't see a need to start now. There's no reason for doing it. Now, let me just say, if you choose to wear a wedding ring, it, I, I realize it's not the same as other jewelry, okay? So my, I'm not judging anybody who wears a wedding ring and think you're less of a Christian than I am, okay? Just please don't ever take it that way. I'm just sharing some biblical reasons why I don't. If you think differently, your conscience tells you you should, I don't want you to go get your conscience, okay? You've got to follow what God is convicting you of. Is that clear? So I'm not just, just making that 100% distinction there that I'm not the one who's telling you about the wedding ring. But I would say, if your wedding ring is something that you know, makes you do this when you walk because it's so heavy, you might even think about that or simplifying things. Anyway, if some, some women, some men put a wedding ring on their wives to say, I don't want my wife to be picked or you know, hit on at work. It's probably the biggest reason today that Christians use. I'll tell you something. If you want to protect your wife, she doesn't need a ring. Just get her a German shepherd. That'll do it. And, uh, and, and again, by the way, when I'm, when I'm around somebody who, like I'm in, the, I'm in the grocery store, and I'm going through the line, and there's a you know, pretty young lady there or something like that, and she smiles at me, kind of flirtatious like, which is, this has never happened, but I'm prepared if it does. And she, and she says, you know what I do? And I have done this before in various circumstances. I'll say, um, you know, how are you doing today? Oh, yeah, my wife sent me out to shop. Or, you know, you know I'm just here picking this up for my wife. And you know, I, I throw that in there pretty quick because sometimes people do look at your hand and see, are you married? But that's not always a good indicator anyway. So I'm just throwing it out there. Um, not a big deal. But what should be our guide when it comes to what we put on our bodies? Should it be our personal opinion, the worldly customs, family pressure, or the Bible? When I say family pressure, by the way, uh, my dad had a really nice gold watch that he got. I don't even know where he got it from when he died. It's one of the few things that survived the fire. Our, everything we had burned down. But that, excuse me, that one was in a safe. When that burned down, he, uh, that, my brother, my dad's wedding ring, and his watch was the only thing that survived. And I'm like, I, I don't need it. So I, my brother had it. Even the family pressure. But let's say you have a necklace that your grandma gave you. You don't have to wear it. You can put it in a frame on the wall. Just don't, but the Bible says not to wear it, not to put it on. What about makeup? I'm going to breeze through this one here. Um, the Bible does talk about Jeremiah 430. And when you're plundered, what will you do? Though you close yourself with crimson, though you adorn yourself with ornaments of gold, Though you enlarge your eyes with paint, and in vain you make yourself fair, your lovers will despise you, they will seek your life. This is a prophecy about the end days, something to be very much aware of. And, uh, and, I'm, and look, I'm not here to say anybody who puts makeup on as a Jezebel. You know, Jezebel in the Bible put a lot of makeup on. Um, there is makeup that's designed to say, look at me. And then there's makeup that says, don't necessarily look at me. You know, like, like they're covering things up and making things natural. You see the difference? And so I'm not here to, again, judge people's, I'm, you're going to think, he's going to look at me every time he sees, no, I'm not looking at anybody, okay? Jesus does the looking, I just do some talking, I'll be, I'll be done with this, okay? <laughs> anyway, what, what's the most pleasing thing to Jesus? That's the question tonight, and I'm going to ask, if you're part of the 144,000, who are you going to follow? The world? The Bible says you will follow the Lamb wherever he goes. And uh, 1 Timothy 2.9, it says, In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with shame faces and sobriety, not with boidered hair, gold, or pearl, or costly array. So what should Christians wear? What kind of clothes should they wear? Modest clothes. Now, the tough thing about modesty is every culture sees that differently, right? And so who are we to say that our culture is the one to define what modesty is? Well, I, think, I don't think Americans got it right. I'm just going to say what they think is my That's a modest bathing suit. My friend, you're wearing underwear. There's no such thing as a modest bathing suit like that, you know? Um, but when God made man... I believe God made him modest. You, you know, they're in the Garden of Eden. We say, oh, every picture you see paints Adam and Eve as completely naked, right? But I believe they were wearing the same thing that they wore in the book of Revelation, the saints in Revelation. They wore these white robes of righteousness. But it's not white in the sense of like garments. They were, they were glowing white. They were bright. The, bright. the bright linen of the saints. That was what the saints wore in the garden. In fact, that's why when they sinned, that glory went away from them. All of a sudden, they're realizing, find me some figs, Eve. 
Fig leaves, I should say. So God clothed them in, or God, they lost their covering. Then what did Jesus do? He gave them coverings. He gave them skins to cover their nakedness. Matthew 5, 28 says, Whosoever looketh upon a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery in his heart. And by the way, men, don't blame the women for your lusting, okay? Don't blame the women. You are responsible for what you see, and Jesus is going to hold you accountable for what you see. No matter how immodest women dress, men are responsible. Now let me tell you something. Women, you're responsible for how you dress. Women are responsible for their, what, how they dress and what they look at. Men are responsible the same way. So what am I suggesting here today? No, I'm not suggesting this. Come on, guys. Don't think I'm saying this. I'm not, you have to dress up like a nun or a Muslim woman. I'm not saying that at all. But I would say that Christians should dress modestly and simply like the Bible says. And, and, and I will say, women, I'm not blaming women for sin or lust, but I'll say you can, Christian women should go a little distance to help men out in the sense of not wearing things too tight or too short or, you know what I'm saying? Just use both common sense and a prayerful attitude to say, God, what would you have me to wear? And through that, I believe God's going to give you just what you need to do what's right. Lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, or pride of life. God wants us to have pure desires, to look unto Jesus, and to have the humility of life. 1 Peter 2.9 you're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Are you God's peculiar people? You know what peculiar means? Some people think it means weird. <laughs> it doesn't necessarily mean weird, but it does mean different. God would have his people be different than the world. Israel has always looked different. They've always been known as being different. Friends, don't be ashamed of the difference of being a Christian today. Be those peculiar people. When somebody sees you walking down the street, are they going to know that you're a Christian? Now, you may be, even, even hypocrites can dress modestly, but God would still have us, despite what hypocrites do, to do what's right. So my appeal tonight, and I went long, my appeal tonight is to take up your cross. Whatever that, tonight you probably heard something that's a cross. By God's grace, he will give you the power to take up your cross and follow Jesus. Do you believe tonight? I'm going to ask you a, a question. Are you willing to cry out in faith to Jesus Christ and say, God, help me to stop doing anything that displeases you and start doing everything that pleases you. Anybody here bold enough to pray that prayer? Amen. Every hand went up, it looks like. And let's pray together and ask God that very thing. My Father in heaven, what a tough subject tonight. My own heart was stirred as I thought about pride and lust of the eyes and the lust of the flesh as Satan would do everything he can to move us away from what pleases you. Lord, tonight I'm asking you, my friends here are asking you together, give us the power to be overcomers. Give us the power to be victorious over the world. You say that whoever loves the world, the love of the Father is not in them. Lord, I don't want to love the world. My friends don't want to. We want the love of Jesus in our heart. Help it to drive out any desires for anything that doesn't please you. Oh, Father, please cleanse us from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, helping us to perfect holiness in the fear of God. We love you, and we know your grace is sufficient, so we claim it tonight, and we claim it in the name of Jesus, your Son. Amen. My friends, God bless you. You endure.